Well, thank you, um, Adeline. It's uh, an honor to be here with all you inspirational delegates in this wonderful panel um, on stage giving the introduction to female leadership. Um, when talking about things this big, it's tempting to come up with a one phrase fits all summary for female leadership. It's tempting to say things like, women make better leaders than men. Uh, women are more politically galvanized than men. Women are smarter than men. But the problem is, is that I'm pretty sure only one of those is true. Um, the bit about women being smarter, obviously. <laughs> uh, um, and, and also, that's just not how the world works. The world works uh, in a far more subversive and dynamic way. So I'm going to very briefly um, talk to you about two things. Um, I'm going to leave it to the rest of the panelists to talk to you about women and business and women entrepreneurs. And I'm going to talk to you about the good and the bad uh, when it comes to leadership, about women outside of power and women inside of power. So to start with the good. Outside of power, there are huge gains to be had from female leadership. Women raise communities. Um, it's without question the best way to develop a community, without question is to empower women. It's been shown that women spend more of their incomes on their households than men do. So when you empower a woman and increase her income, uh, the welfare of her family automatically shoots up. A woman who is empowered with a job is going to take that money and not only spend it on herself, but spend it on her family and on her community. So as she does that, you see certain things almost automatically. You see education rises as she spends money to send her children to school. As education rises, you see health improve and increase. As health and education improve and increase, you have things like a more hygiene awareness, reproductive health awareness, and then you see life expectancy rise. A woman's success is almost always going to benefit not just herself, but a larger network of people. It's going to benefit her family, her neighborhood, and possibly even her society. You see also, and you'll hear more about this, I'm sure, in a minute, um, that women make more responsible entrepreneurs. They repay loans more diligently than men. They are medium-term thinkers, as opposed to men, sorry again, who are short-term thinkers. Um, and just for, the, just for the record, nobody thinks long-term, so let's not get too excited. Um, so while men are thinking short-term and they are focusing on profits today, um, women are looking at the tricky challenges to get through the future. We could take from that that a woman's way of looking at the world is through future generations and through the immediate world around her, whether it's her neighborhood or her community or her immediate network. And we can even go further than that and say that women have longer time horizons than men. Men influence the present, but women influence the future. In this way, then, you have an inherent disposition towards leadership. Um, in this way, women are already leaders, and they embody not just leadership qualities, but they embody progressive, sustainable leadership qualities. And this is on the ground. This is when we talk about the powerless, when we talk about women outside of power. But when we look at women inside of power, we see a different dynamic altogether. And what we really see within the confines of power is that there is less that separates women from men. I'm going to, I'm going to take um, Bob Geldof's suggestion, which I'm sure everyone has, and just be unreasonable here, because you can't only have good things told to you. So for the bad news, if you look at, I mean, this is not the bad news, but we'll get to it in a second. If you, if you look at the world's five most populous Muslim countries, um, you find that all those countries, though you may not expect it, have had female leadership. They have all had female heads of state, presidents, and prime ministers. Um, if you look at South Asia, uh, where you know, 1.5 billion people reside, you'll find that all the countries in South Asia have had women heads of state. Um, you see the same trend replicated in parts of East Asia. And these are not flukes. These are not one-off um, women leaders. These are women who are elected repeatedly, consecutively, and continually. The problem is, is that in every single one of these cases, 
in literally every one of them, you find that these women all belong to political dynasties. So they are all the wives, daughters, mothers, sisters of former male leaders. Um, that might not be so disturbing, but what you find more disturbingly in most, but not all of these cases again, are the twin menaces of corruption. And when I say corruption, I don't mean minor, but, but major graft and the use of violent force. So wars, occupations, invasions have been as easily started by the 20th century's female leaders as by their male counterparts. Women do not inspire peace just by virtue of their gender. Um, this idea of the, the no crying rule that David brought up earlier, uh, they don't cry, they make other people cry um, in many cases. Um, another example of, of the seven, and maybe a more recent one, of the seven American soldiers tried for abusing prisoners in the infamous Abu Ghraib prison, three of the seven were women. In fact, one of the ringleaders, Lydia England, was a woman. An apologist said, well, this is not really a case of, um, of, of gender. You know, if we had more women in that situation, if we had women in higher positions, um, the humiliation and the torture that one found at Abu Ghraib could have been averted, except that that's not true. The head of the Abu Ghraib prison, and in fact the head of southern and central Iraq's 15 other prisons, was a woman, uh, General Janice Karpinski. Power is a transformative force, and as women especially, we cannot afford a lazy, um, feminist international approach to power, which is to say that all women make better leaders simply because they are women. That's not true. History doesn't support it. It has to be about the quality of leadership rather than the gender. And power being a transformative force, women are as easily transformed by that power as men are. So I think what, what I'd like to put forward, what I think especially the amazing women that I've met at this um, convention center, what I think we need to be very vigilant about is the fact that gender can never be a substitute for ethics. Gender can never and must never be a substitute for the principles of justice. It can never be a substitute for a commitment to nonviolence or to progressive policy. And women fight battles on numerous fronts. Whether we are inside or outside of power, women fight on the home front, they fight in the workplace, they fight in politics, they fight in front of the law, they fight for liberty, they fight for equality, and they fight for safety. And it's not enough that we as women fight all these battles, which we must. Um, and it's simply not enough that we win them. But whether we are inside or outside of power, we must ensure that we fight ethically. Thank you.